Uh, God taking us on to maturity. Chapter 6, verse 1 is the theme verse of the entire book. Let's just review quickly the overview of the entire book, again, as we've done most of the days. And, and reputation er, uh, aids learning. Again, Gregory's seventh law of learning, <laughs> part of my master's degree in college. And uh, so I've repeated a lot, but that's the way we get it, all right? Uh, the key verse in Hebrews is Hebrews 6, verse 1, let us go on unto perfection. And the believer will make spiritual progress when he understands that, first of all, he understands the superior person of Christ. Christ is better than the prophets, chapter 1, better than the angels, chapter 2, better than Moses, chapter 3, better than Aaron, chapters 4 through 6. And, and then a superior priesthood, which is the order of Melchizedek, where Jesus Christ is portrayed as the priest of Melchizedek, who was a king priest. And so we know that Jesus Christ is not only the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, but he's also the king of kings and the Lord of lords in his kingdom. And then a superior principle, which we've been looking at the last two days, and that's the principle of faith. And we looked at the examples of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. What a powerful chapter that was. And the endurance of faith yesterday. Boy, did I enjoy teaching on the endurance of faith. And, and all through that chapter, it talks about enduring three times. Enduring by faith. And that means this. For you have need of promises, or you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. There's always a delay uh, from the time you understand the promise by revelation, by rhema, the time that you understand the promise and it's fulfilled. It doesn't always happen right away. Oftentimes it will take time. Just like God doesn't immediately judge sin in our life. He gives us time to repent. And oftentimes the same principle works with faith. God doesn't always answer our prayers immediately. He, he lets us endure by faith. Even as Abraham was tested by Isaac and he went up that mountain, oftentimes God will allow us to be tested, to be tested with our faith because it strengthens us. It gives us power to become more, uh, to become stronger in our faith. And today we have the evidences of faith. We have the evidences of faith. A great chapter. Wow. I love it. And uh, uh, you have to understand now as we go back to the history of the book of Hebrews, uh, you know, these people were told by the enemy that if you follow Christ, you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your friends, your material goods, your religious heritage in the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood that they had under Judaism. But here Paul points to the fact that the believer loses nothing. Oh, yeah, by faith, the Christian turns his back on material religious systems of the world which in this case, of course, was Judaism. But he fixes his eyes and heart on the true spiritual worship of God in Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, we saw yesterday, the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega. How can this fail? We're going to see today Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging. How about it? How, listen, how about attaching to something that's unchanging, something you can count on tomorrow? He was there yesterday, he's here today, and he's going to be there tomorrow. Just like God told Moses and Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God tells us today, he will not leave us. So we have actually, uh, wow, we have, uh, uh, let's see, five points today. Five points, and they have to do with uh, our spiritual fellowship of love, our spiritual treasures, our spiritual food in the word, uh, our spiritual sacrifices, and then our spiritual power. That's my outline of chapter 13, and let's take a look at it quickly. Uh, first of all, our spiritual fellowship of love. You see, love of the brethren is one of the true marks of a believer. Behold how they loved one another. When the power of God fell in the book of Acts, we studied a month or two back. In Acts chapter 2, they were all with one accord in one place. And you know what? Um, everybody that had needs, the others met those needs. That's true love. Uh, we just helped one of our team members move uh, moved this week from his house to another home. 
And uh, because the house he was in, which was a double wide trailer, Joe and Carol, uh, there was mold in that house. It was affecting her health, as you've heard on the radio. And she went to live in Patsy's home for a while. But we moved her and Joe into the apartment yesterday. And so we called our brother to help come and show love. And they came with their truck. And everybody got, you know, it, was, it took us an hour. It would have taken Joe a full day or maybe two days to move all that stuff. But because of all the love of the brother and man, it was fun. And then we all went out and got, I hate to admit it christopher we got christopher lewinsky who's a health and beauty expert right we ate uh i had a whooper yesterday a whopper (laughs) joe went out and bought us all whopper dinners (laughs) that's all right and uh, so i go i goofed on my my diet yesterday but anyway love of the brethren a mark of true believer according to first john 3 16 and john 13 35. It's the mark of the true believer. And Christians often are hated by the world, according to John 15, verse 70. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And sometimes the world doesn't look very favorably on us as believers. So we need the mutual love of the brethren. And you know what? This this love is expressed in such a practical way. And let's read about it in Hebrews 13. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember that are them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and would suffer adversary, as being yourselves also in the body, or adversity, I'm sorry, not adversary, would suffer adversity. So one of the ways we can show Christian love is by sympathizing with those who are going through difficult times, as our Haitian brethren are right now, as this nation is suffering right now. We sympathize with these people. We feel the hurt and the loss and the death of family members and and workers and Christian missionaries are are, are dead down there and, and I mean it's it, and and the 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 archbishop of the entire nation was killed in this earthquake yesterday. I mean you know there's a lot of a lot of devastation. We sympathize with those in trials, and we're hospitable. Some of the greatest blessings of our life have come through hospitality. I remember an apostle came to stay with us for a week a conference. In, in our apartment, we didn't have a big apartment out there in Seattle when Marianne and I were out there. We didn't have any children, so we were alone in this apartment. But Marianne was desperately, desperately trying to have children. We, uh, we had already gone quite a number of years in our marriage and didn't have any kids, and her dream was always to have children. And this spiritual brother, I mean, this brother, during the night, we began to hear him praying in the other room and groaning and praying and praying in the spirit. And this went on for hours and we were trying to, you know, sleep. But but we understood that he was interceding and interceding and interceding for us. And, And I'll tell you what, he was an angel of God. And the next morning we got up to have breakfast with him and he said, you know what? He said, I prayed all night for you, Mariana, because he said, I know your heart's desire is to have children. And he said, I finally had a breakthrough toward morning. And he said, you know what? God told me that you're going to have two children, a boy and a girl. Guess what? We've got Christopher and Isabella. (laughs) How about that? And I believe it was that angel that we entertained in, in our home. I remember I was doing an outreach one time downtown Seattle with a homeless. And this man walks up and he actually looked like an angel. He looked like an angel. He had this little suitcase. And he said, you know what? He said, I... I need help. He said, you know of anybody that could help me tonight? I need a place to stay. And the Lord spoke to me and said, take him into your home. So we took him into our home. You know what he was? He was a priest, or he was a professor of a Jesuit university in France. And part of this Jesuit order was a vow of poverty. They didn't look to any earthly goods. He had flown to Seattle to be with his monsignor, And while he was in Seattle, his monsignor died. And it left this poor priest devastated. He had no place to go, no way to get back to France. And the interesting thing was, now get this, he was the son of one of the wealthiest men of Europe. His father owned a whole section of New York Harbor. His father owned a perfume company of a well-known perfume company in Europe and was a multi, multi, multi multi-millionaire. But when this young man went into the priesthood, his father disowned him. And his sister got all the inheritance of her her father. And this man was left with nothing. And we took him into our home. And what a blessing he was. I sat and talked theology with this man. He taught the history of the church in this Jesuit university. He was an angel from God. I mean, he was kind of a unique guy because I remember... (laughs) 
He, everything in our house had to be perfectly straightened. He would go to the drawer and open it up and straighten our silverware and make sure the forks were all stacked properly and the spoons were stacked properly. You know, I, I think he had a little bit of a obsession with perfection, but that's okay. <laughs> More of us need that, right? But we've had we've been hospital to people, and and sometimes it's turned out to be a real blessing for us personally. You never know. The Bible says when you're entertaining stra- angels unawares in verse two, be, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some of entertained angels. Even as Abraham uh, saw those two angels come to them and they announced that he was going to have a son. And and Sarah laughed. (laughs) Some believe that was a Christophany, that Jesus actually an Old Testament appearance of Christ. But uh, whether it was or not, we don't know. But but, but listen, be aware sometimes when you take people into your home, you might be entertaining angels unaware. So first of all is the spiritual fellowship of love. Number two is spiritual treasures, and that's verses five and six. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he saith, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hello? What's the greatest treasure you have? Oh, it's my bank account. It's my job. It's my business. It's my possessions. It's my home. It's all paid for. I've got a beautiful car. Maybe you have boats and airplanes. Who knows what you've got? You may think these treasures are wonderful. No, they're not. The greatest treasure you can have is a treasure of contentment. Isn't that beautiful? It says, be content. The promises God gave to Moses and Joshua, as I said earlier, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Wow. Wow. And when the child of God is in the will of God, obeying the word of God, he will never lack the things of God. He cannot be harmed. God puts a divine protection around you. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Why? Because Samuel brought the nation Israel into spiritual relationship with God. They walked in the will of God under Samuel's rule, it says, as prophet Old Testament prophet in 1 Samuel chapter 7 it says the hands of the Lord the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines God put a divine protection around Israel because there was spiritual obedience in the nation Samuel had brought the entire nation through repentance and they poured water out as a sign of repentance and the whole nation fasted and prayed because they were surrounded by the enemy and God delivered them and, and then God only delivered them. He restored all the cities that the Philistines had taken. And, and, and it says, and Samuel built altars unto the Lord and he judged the nation righteously. So there was justice, there was divine justice and divine worship and divine protection and divine restoration. Why? Because of a man that brought the nation into obedience of the will of God. Come on. That's the real spiritual treasure of a nation. It's not how much money we have in the bank. It's not how big our bankrolls are. It's not how much wealth our country has. It's how much of the blessing of the Lord we have. So first of all is spiritual fellowship and love. Secondly is our spiritual treasures. Thirdly is the spiritual food in the Word. Oh, I love this. I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. I get excited every day when I get up because I get to study the Word so I can teach you every afternoon. And by the way, I'm go- on the 1st of February, I'm launching out by faith, and we're going to be going on the radio here at 7.30 in the morning, the drive time in the morning in Tampa Bay. And the stuff that I teach, Uh, The things that I teach uh, uh, in the evening from 5.30 to 6, we're going to replay now in the morning from 7.30 to 8. So if you want to help sponsor that teaching, you know, help us out on this because I believe God wants me on in the morning when the people, because every morning as I'm driving around, going to the YMCA and everything, I listen to AM radio. I like talk radio. And I will often listen to some of my favorite teachers on some of the other radio stations. So I'm going to be on every morning at 7.30 to 8, just with the teaching, not with a whole kingdom hour, but just the half hour of teaching. God told me to do it, so I'm stepping out by faith, and God's going to provide. So pray with me about that. But the spiritual food of the Word of God, verses 7 through 10, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the Word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you hear me preach about Jesus Christ on this radio station? If you're following my teachings, am I talking about Jesus every day? What's the central message of this? It's not politics. It's not self-improvement. It's not seven steps on how to be a better you. Come on. 
We talk about Jesus. Jesus Christ is the solution to everybody's problem, and he is from Genesis 1 all the way through Revelation 20. Jesus Christ is the message of the Word of God, and what I do every day is I bring Jesus Christ to you through the Word of God. And so the Bible says, remember them which have this rule over you. What is this rule over you? Well, uh, he's not referring to uh, uh, <laughs> running your life. It literally is the Greek word to lead. To lead. And it's mentioned three times here, by the way. It's mentioned here in verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you. Verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit to them. And then also, uh, verse 24, salute them that have the rule over you. So three things that you're to do to, the, to, to us who teach the word. Number one, you're to remember us. And then number two, you're to obey the word that we teach. Not to obey Jerry Brandt. You're to obey the word of God that we teach you. And then you're to salute us. What does that mean? <laughs> that means to show, I guess, to show, show that you care, right? Salute us. Greet us with a... And what does Paul said? Greet us with a holy kiss. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are. Spiritual food of the word. So remember them that have the rule over you. Because we preach to you Jesus Christ, the living word. And then obey them that have the rule over you. Let me read that verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls as they them that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, you see, when I teach the word on this program, I take a big responsibility that I tell you the truth. That I don't put Jerry Brand in here at all. That I let the Spirit of God. You see, it's the anointing that teaches us all things. I ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach through me every day. I don't want to teach my own thoughts. Why do I teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse? Why am I expositorily teaching you? Why? Because I don't want to make any mistakes in misguiding you. Because the Word of God must translate the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than in a two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How are you going to know yourself? It's through the word. How are you going to grow authority? It's through the word. How are you going to become more Jesus? It's through the word. But you have a responsibility back to me. I'm not telling it like it is. If you listen to me today, then you must obey the word that I teach if it's truly of God. But be like the Bereans. Go and search the scriptures to see if what I am telling you is true. And if I'm not preaching the word, don't listen to me anymore. Go find somebody that is. But you're to obey the word that we teach you. You're to respect those that are in spiritual leadership as teachers, as pastors. And you're to submit to the word of God. Submit yourselves, it says, for they watch over your souls. This is a big responsibility. The teacher is under double responsibility. I have an accountability to God that's greater than people that don't teach. And the fact that I'm on the radio and pot potentially reaching tens of thousands of people with this teaching, I have a huge responsibility before God. And I accept that. I don't take it lightly. But you better obey the word that I teach. Because <laughs> I, I must give an account of your soul to God. Someday at the beam of seat of Christ. I have to give an account of your soul. And by the way, Friday this week, I'm going to play a message. It is outstanding. Oh, my lands. Friday between, listen, between 6 and 7 o'clock this Friday, I'm going to play a message for you that's going to blow your mind. It's, it's the beam of seat of Christ. That, uh, it's something I received recently that, that somebody uh, encouraged me to get. And, and uh, I tell you what, I want to play this message on the radio of this, this preacher. Uh, I'm telling you what, you'll be blessed. You will be blessed by this this word. I mean, it, it will potentially change your life. And that's going to be this Friday. So make sure you listen. So obey them that have the rule over you, and then salute them that have the, uh, the rule over you. And people are to speak to their leaders uh, and, and, uh, and to be on speaking terms with them. It's a tragedy when Christians become angry with their pastor or, or teacher or refuse to talk to them, and, and then they disobey the word of God. Listen, if the believer does not feed on the word, he will feed on strange doctrines, and that's what it's, exactly what it talks about here. Be not carried away, verse 9, with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meats which have not profited them. 
that have not been occupied therein. What does that mean? For we have an altar. All right, we'll get into that in a minute. But listen, if you don't spend time in the Word, you're going to listen to some guy at work, some lady at work with some strange teaching or doctrine that's off the wall that, that doesn't come out of the context of the Word of God. You see, you're to compare Scripture with Scripture. You're to compare the Word of God with the Word of God. I taught on faith in Hebrews 11, but I don't teach on faith every day. I'm a faith teacher. Yeah, I was a faith teacher a couple of days ago when I was in Hebrews 11, but I'm not a faith teacher today. <laughs> well, I am a faith teacher, you know what I mean? But you know what? It's balancing the word. I mean, sometimes some preachers, all they preach is faith. That's, that's, that's what they call themselves, faith preachers. Let's go to the entire word of God. Let's have a balance of scripture. You better have a doctrine for suffering along with faith. I mean, you better have because you're going to be, you're going to have suffering in this world. And if you're going through hard times because you think your faith isn't strong enough, you're going to, you listen, it's got to hurt your faith, not help it. We fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. Yes, we do. Why? Because he's perfecting us, we found out yesterday. Okay. So finally, now the spiritual sacrifices. So we've, uh, you know, we've seen, uh, what have we seen so far? Well, spiritual fellowship of love, spiritual treasures, which is contentment, spiritual food in the word, which means you are to obey three times, <laughs> then that, that have rule over you. And that rule, again, is that lead you into the word of God. And then spiritual sacrifices. And that begins in verse 11. We've got to move along. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Mm. Let us therefore go unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For we have here no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's a heavenly city. And therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks in his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God, God is well pleased. For such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Well, we're going to get into the call here in the next hour. I guess somebody's calling in early here today. But we're not going to take that call yet, all right? In our prayer time. So here we have it. But do good to them that communicate and forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So we have spiritual sacrifices. And then, uh, finally... Finally, oh, by the way, as a kingdom of priests, Christians are to offer spiritual sacrifices. What is a spiritual sacrifice? It's something done or given in the name of Jesus Christ for his glory. That's what a spiritual sacrifice is. Praise, uh, you know, from the lips is such a sacrifice. So uh, the, the other spiritual sacrifices include the believer's body, Romans 12, offerings, prayer, a broken heart, and the souls won to Christ. These are all spiritual sacrifices that the Bible talks about. And then finally, spiritual power. Finally, spiritual power. Oh, I'm sorry about that. All right, we'll figure out how to use this phone here. <laughs> We're getting ready for our prayer time next hour. I'll tell you, people are already calling in, and this is exciting. So if you're listening by phone, uh, by, by internet or uh, live on the radio, please call in in a few minutes. We're going to get into the prayer time. Now, finally, in this chapter, we have the spiritual power. Beginning in verse 17. What does this mean? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch over your souls. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willingly to live honestly. But I beseech you rather to do this that I may be restored to you sooner. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Thank you, Patsy. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, Suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Salute them that, are, that have the rule over you, and in all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be to you all. Amen. Well, this finishes the chapter. What does it mean, the spiritual power? It literally means that we now, as Christians, are enabled to live in an evil world, but we're able to live by the power of the Holy Spirit of God for Christ. 
Because why? Christ works for us from heaven. (laughs) He's not subject to this world. Aren't you glad? There are three separate titles given to Jesus Christ here. I love it. As the shepherd. First of all, the good shepherd who dies for the sheep. Secondly, the great shepherd who perfects the sheep. (laughs) And finally, the chief shepherd who will return for the sheep. You see, it says here, verse 20, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd. The good shepherd talked about in John 10, verse 11, and Psalms 22. But here, the great shepherd, perfecting the sheep. That's what the theme of Hebrews is all about, perfecting us. And then the chief shepherd who's going to return for the sheep someday. Our high priest is our shepherd and helper. He works in us. And then he works through us. Isn't that powerful? First of, he worked, first of all, he worked for us. We looked at that in Ephesians. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, if you were part of that study. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of our works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. His work for us is salvation. His work in us is sanctification. And his work through us is service. It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. God cannot work through us until he first of all works in us. And that's what he does through the word of God. Are you allowing the heavenly shepherd to feed you and lead you? If you are, then you will grow in maturity because that's what Hebrews is really all about. Hadn't this been a wonderful book? It's been a wonderful book. (laughs) Oh, full of warnings, but full of blessings. So today, what have we learned? What have we learned today? That this closing chapter brings us to spirituality, our spiritual fellowship of love, our spiritual treasure, contentment, our spiritual food, which is the word of God, our spiritual sacrifice, which is a sacrifice of praise, not only with our lips, but with our life. And finally, our spiritual power, that the resurrected Jesus Christ is going to work in us and through us. Wow. Hebrews, a wonderful, wonderful book. And all this is going to be on the Internet, by the way. If you go to our website, actionevangelism.com, you're going to be able to pick up the archives. We're launching Kingdom Life University with all the teachings we're doing on the radio. So you're going to be able to go back and listen to any one of the teachings, listen through the whole book of Hebrews, chapter by chapter again, if you'd like. It's going to be, I'm separating these teachings out of the two-hour program, putting them on the Internet in our Kingdom Life University. I'm excited about this. I'm excited that you're with us. I'm excited that we are all together in this thing. <laughs> And that, you know what, this is your program, not just mine. We're in this together. And Kingdom Life is my has been a vision of mine for a long time. And I praise God that we are able to celebrate together through the Word of God and to pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that those that have not received Christ may do so. I ask, Father, in the name of Jesus, that salvation would come right now to their heart. If you've not accepted Jesus, I'm going to mention three things to you in closing. One, God loves you and has a plan for your life. For God so loved the world that he gave. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. So first of all, God loves you. Number two, God says you are lost without Jesus. Your sins have separated you from God. There's a great chasm between you and God. You don't know God because you have not come through the blood of Jesus. But you can today. In just a moment, you can. And thirdly, you can have the life of Christ today. His life today. You can have it now. Now. Isn't that awesome? So all you need to do right now is receive Jesus by faith. Would you pray with me? Say, in the name of Jesus, Father, I accept this great salvation. Say it with me. In Jesus' name, I invite Jesus Christ into my heart. Today, wash my sins away. Cleanse me by your power. Lord, make me a child of God and give me standing right now in the heavenlies. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that I would find today this great salvation through Christ. 